Hello and welcome to Green Shoots, a show where we have a heart-to-heart -heart chat with the founders of startups to understand the genesis, nurturing, and the growth of their startups. I'm Manisha Nayar Dhawan. On this show, we are joined today by Robin Chhabra, founder of Textris. A warm welcome to the show, Robin. How are you? Hi, hi, Anisha. Uh, doing good. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So Dextrous has a co-working space in Mumbai's Bandra Kurla complex and Lobo Kurel. And of course, uh, Robin has uh, vast amounts of knowledge uh, of real estate, co-working, architectural design, resource management, and uh, customer experience. Uh, so Robin, what made you come up with this idea of having um, a, you know, a co-working space? And when did you set up Dextrous? Um, so it was an interesting personal journey. Um, I think uh, for us, uh, for me, uh, I'm, I'm professionally an architect. I've spent almost 12 years uh, working in the architecture field in different companies abroad and things like that. And um, I was very keen to understand um, the uh, design aspects um, as well as the real estate aspects. We kind of, as designers, you're always looking at uh, design. You're not looking at the business of design. So I think um, I was very keen on understanding the business of design uh, in particular in India. And um, it kind of dawned on me that I wasn't uh, getting a sense of that as much. Uh, I was too involved in design all the time. Um, and co-working was kind of uh, coming into the picture in 2016 um, uh, it was still very nascent. We were kind of hearing murmurs about WeWork and uh, it was still something out of New York um, and it wasn't as big as it is today. Uh, and it got me thinking um, that um, co-working is an interesting juxtaposition of design and business thinking. Uh, and it helps you because you have to think of the real estate product very holistically. And uh, you have to um, not only design and build it, but you also have to run it for you know, 10, 20 years. Uh, so you have to be very careful with your decisions. Uh, so I felt like it was a very um, interesting experiment that um, I wanted to pursue. And uh, so in 2016, I kind of, towards the end, I put in my papers and I wanted to take the leap and take a crack at it. And that's when we started working on uh, Dextrous and we officially launched our first space um, in March of 2018. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how did it feel for you first, uh, Robin? Because, you know, designing of space and running a business is quite different. Uh, it's not yeah. really the same, right? So how was the experience like for you? It's, ve it's very messy. <laughs> uh, nothing trains you for it. Uh, but it's interesting. There are a lot of parallels in architecture and in business. Architecture is as messy that you kind of have to understand. You have to be a jack of all trades. Uh, you have to understand design at multiple levels. And you also have to understand project management. You have to understand how to deal with people, your clients, or your own bosses. So I felt like a lot of the skill sets are very similar. Um, and um, and that helped. Um, and I think, as you know, in architecture, uh, you, you know, there are countless number of hours where you don't sleep, you're just constantly working. Uh, and that too in entrepreneurship has a lot of similarities. Um, so it kind of fitted in quite easily. Um, but I think um, I love the I love the experience because every day is very different. There are a lot of challenges, uh, so many things you don't think about uh, and you have to start thinking about very quickly and you need to create solutions. Uh, so it's very exciting. Uh, it's now the fifth year, and um, I'm actually now going to the sixth year, and it's it's kind of like, um, nothing sort of stops surprising you, like everything keeps coming on. So it's quite exciting that way. So, uh, Robin, did you ever think that a co-working works as a business? Because even we works, you know, uh, it's IPO, and there was there were a lot of issues, you know. So yeah. Co-working isn't as uh, clean and dry. It's not as straightforward as other people think. Uh, yeah. What are the challenges that come uh, with uh, running a co-working uh, space? And as a business model, how successful is it? I think the experience with WeWork, one had to realize that you can't rush it. You really have to think through your scale, your numbers. Um, I think there is definitely a large business model, um, a very successful one uh, for that matter. Um, but you have to be prudent and you have to be patient because real estate is slow. You have to construct and you have to see how it plays out. Uh, everything doesn't happen quickly. You know, if you look at if you compare us to technology companies, a lot of them uh, create an app. They send it out. It's on App Store. In about two, three months, you're seeing whether it's successful and, and you kind of have a fair idea of where you're headed. Um, so uh, unfortunately, in real estate, that doesn't happen that way. We, uh, building a wall, building all these things is take time. 
Uh, and then once uh, you're out there, marketing takes a long time and, and getting your name out there takes a long time. Um, so it's, um, I think the business model is is particularly there, especially if you focus on a niche audience, like you have to think about your target audience um, you, because there are different uh, brackets. If you think about it like a hotel, um, you have different kinds of hotels. You have two star, three star, five star hotels, and there's different target audiences for each type. And I think that's that was a very important thing that dawned on us, uh, especially when we did our research in that first one, one and a half year, um, was that you can't come out thinking of creating a co-working space for everybody. Uh, you have to think about who your audience is. And I think that uh, that focus um, helped us a lot and it kept things um, humble and it kept things small. Like you kind of had to try it, go, go bit by bit, see how the first center does and then uh, go forward with the next. So I think I think that all those points really helped us um, create a good uh, perspective on how to go about um, tackling co-working, yeah. Okay, so uh, Robin, at one place, you were doing all the research on you know who's the audience, uh, who's going to be coming into the co-working space, and then you suddenly hit by a pandemic. So when the first lockdown happened, there was distress in real estate, uh, commercial real estate, even in the co-working space because everything was shut. So how yeah. did you deal with this? Yeah, uh, I think uh, the pandemic has been a hundred-year flood, maybe uh, for commercial real estate, for malls and things like that. It's um, it's messy. And uh, nobody was prepared for it. I think I remember the time when we were thinking, uh, oh, the lockdown's for one week. Oh, it's for two weeks, okay, and three weeks. And it just kept on going and got worse and worse. Um, I think one of the strategies we had, um, which helped us through the pandemic, was we, because of the target audience that I was talking about, our focus has always been professional companies, companies that are coming in from abroad, uh, they're looking to set up space in India. These companies tend to think very long term. They understand the requirements um, and they are prepared for a lot of these exigencies which you can't you can't kind of deal with and they stay a lot more stable in their decisions having said that there were still companies that uh, wanted to discuss with us if there were any ways we could uh, figure out whether it was discounting or um, helping them at a later stage we had to kind of have a very transparent and honest discussion with all our stakeholders uh, because everybody was suffering it wasn't just that hey we're not going to office so office should be free. Um, even the landlords were suffering uh, because they had taken loans to own real estate, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, the entire chain was crashing. And that's why having a conversation to keep that chain linked was very important. Um, and that's what helped us through the pandemic a lot because we were honest with our clients and we were able to figure out how to help um, where uh, where it was possible and where it wasn't, we told them that, you know, we can't. And, and then we had to take some decisions that mutually worked in in both situ for both parties, you know, for that matter. So I think that um, that was a really important point, which was target audience helped us because we we had companies that were quite stable in their outlook. And second was having a very transparent discussion with these companies. And I think the third thing that helps is that we're able to pivot and give clients less or more space as and when they want. And that's one of the benefits all co-working spaces are able to provide. Of course, there's nothing unique about that in any one space. Uh, but I think that helped because there was a, some clients who said, okay, we're gonna you know, scale down post our lock-in period and keep some office space because we know we'll need kind of rotation staff and, uh, and, and things like that. So I think those three uh, parameters really helped us. Um, I think the first two were very unique to Dexterous. The third one's a little bit more. Generate to the industry. Okay, yeah. uh, so the, the USP of the uh, co-working space is of course the flexibility that it gives to companies uh, to you know keep their employees then they don't have to sink in the real estate cost for office premises now uh, how does it work for companies like you that manage co-working space uh, how do you build on predictability of revenues in the future and uh, you know how does it work for you now that you know the pandemic is uh, wearing down things are opening up uh, more people are going back to office and you know it may just be that companies are looking at a flexible way of working where some days people work out of home some days they come to companies some may just go closer to their homes to work for greater productivity so yeah. uh, how does it work from here and because of the flexibility of it all how do you get uh, you know predictability in your revenues 
Yeah, I think uh, the first is that because of the USPs with Dexterous from design um, to service, et cetera, uh, that kind of assures you a constant flow of clients because with word of mouth and, and all our other networks, uh, we, the, the kind of it's spreading. And overall, in general, I think the what the pandemic did is it, it helped uh, co-working uh, come on the radar of a lot of companies and people who weren't looking at it. Um, and we've been seeing a lot of different kinds of companies who are starting to very actively look at co-working uh, because and they then they may not have done that before. And exactly for the reasons you said, because you're able to get flexibility, not just of space, but also of lease terms and things like that. Um, I think predictability for us, um, there have been a couple of things that we've done. One is we've with the second space in Lower Perel, we've taken a lot larger of a space and we've dedicated a lot of space to enterprise clients. So though, and what are enterprise clients? We're looking at very customized um, and uh, curated design for office space for clients who may want to look at a three-year horizon. You know, usually you're looking at a lot of clients who look at five years. Earlier, it used to be almost nine years. Um, so I think the three-year horizon also helps. Uh, two to three-year horizon helps a lot. And uh, that gives us a little bit more stability. Um, and we are also kind of, it's it's where we, we've done a lot of ingenuity and design there where we're able to very quickly um, give different kinds of spaces for different clients over time um, and even the same client over time and uh, be able to customize that relatively quickly. Uh, I think that benefit becomes huge. Um, and because the market is nascent, people are realizing that that advantage. There's a, there's a sort of period where you're educating a lot of the audience. Uh, you have to go through that. And that's that phase that we're in right now. Uh, and, I, and I do think uh, that brings in a lot more stability uh, from that perspective. Um, I think the other side of the stability that uh, one that doesn't get talked enough about is on the landlord side. Uh, you know, if you do pure vanilla leases and things like that, obviously your cost becomes, uh, as a co-working player, becomes much more uh, problematic, right? Because it's a heavy cost. And you have to do that in some places because the space, the location might be amazing. The landlord may not be keen on looking at a revenue share, um, and, but you need to capitalize on that because that space and the and the, and the location is too unique to pass up. Um, but I think overall, um, co-working spaces have to look at uh, deleveraging that risk as well a little bit uh, or, or quite a bit, or at least 50%, I would say. Um, and uh, that's where you could, you know, if you get landlords who are willing to work with you uh, and do revenue share agreements, and I think that would be a huge plus as well for co-working because that will help um, the upside be amazing for landlords when uh, the profits are soaring. And of course, when they're tougher times, it's managed. But over a long period of time of 20 years, if you think about it, they would have a person who's in their uh, sort of operator in their space. So there's a lot of guarantee of future rent for them as well. So I think it goes both sides. Like it's also on, on the client side, but also on the landlord side that you have to manage. So Robin, what metrics do you work with uh, for your company's growth? Uh, what what targets have you set for yourself? And at this point in time, how, yeah. how do the margins look like? So we've, uh, I mean, I think the first thing that you have to get off the bat when you're when you're uh, getting um, new spaces is that you want your occupancies to go up. And um, I think we always target uh, to have a healthy 50 to 60 percent to make sure that um, you know your your kind of uh, your basic costs are all are protected. And um, I think in pandemic, uh, in the pandemic, that's been difficult, but we've been able to keep above that. We've been able to keep uh, our essential cost numbers lower. Um, you know, that's helped us as well. And you have to be very smart and sort of nimble about, about uh, managing that process. Um, and I think uh, the most important part is occupancy. Like you, you want to get a healthy rate occupancy there. Um, and I think as we see the pandemic uh, coming to a close, and of course, we'll see waves. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the hope is that we won't see lockdowns um, because lockdowns are what hurts sentiment the most. Um, but um, when, when you see waves um, and if you're seeing death rates and things like that stay very stable, um, almost minimal, uh, then you're going to see sentiment continue to rise. And that's, gonna, and that's something we're very optimistic about uh, from that perspective. Okay. So what are you planning for the future? You have two centers. Um, are you planning to add more? Are you looking at different geographies, um, you know, popular office markets like Bangalore or Gurgaon? And, um, you know, what are your expansion plans? 
That's a very interesting question because um, I feel like in real estate, things get very complicated very quickly. So you have to be very careful. Um, I mean, short answer is that we are keen to expand because something that we've realized, um, especially with the second center's launch, is that people are really liking the product. Uh, and that's that's always nice to feel. Uh, I mean, we got a sense of that in the first one, but the second one has turned out a lot more of a response, um, a positive response, and we've very quickly been able to fill our current inventory. Um, and I think um, that's given us a lot of confidence that the product that we are making has um, a lot of takers and, and, and it's giving us a lot of confidence. So we do, we are keen on expanding, especially to different cities. Within this city, of course, Bombay, I think, has tremendous scope. Uh, but across cities as well. But I think how we do it is a very important point that we don't want to rush into uh, because um, uh, we want to make sure that we have the right internal systems, uh, be able to design each space as well as we do uh, because, you know, we have a very strong focus on design um, and we don't want to let go of that. So uh, keeping, uh, keeping all of those uh, priorities in mind, I think over the next year, we would be looking at some avenues on, on how to expand. But Carefully, I think that's always been our motto. Right, Robin, you spoke about high occupancies and you said that the second center has seen good response and high occupancy. But yeah. along with the occupancy, what about rentals? Because uh, you know those were depressed during the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What is the outlook like? So I'm just trying to understand yeah. that, you know, occupancy is one of the metrics. How about revenue, revenue growth? What kind yeah. of revenue growth are you looking at in the next three, four years? I think... Um, I mean, for us, the revenue perspective, which is married to price, but also other products that we release is very important because um, occupancy is one metric, but if you're heavily dependent on just seats, that's also going to be a problem. So we've, we've been working on figuring out how to do cross-brand partnerships, et cetera, to be able to uh, bring more revenue from different perspectives. Um, but I think uh, to come back um, on the point on our on the pressure on price per seat, I think that's definitely been there. Uh, we had expected it to perhaps be five to ten percent higher than where it is currently. Uh, but you know, it's a it's a give and take. You kind of have to hold your price as well because if you have belief that your product is worth it, uh, you you kind of need to decide that okay, we're, this is our threshold. Even if the market or maybe your competitors are really undercutting the market and trying to do it, I think you have to believe that um, if you do that, then you're also losing faith in what your product is. So it's a little bit of a risk, uh, but it's always a balance. And, and as a result, we don't get as stressed uh, by just undercutting everything and just selling everything. Because, you know, tomorrow if we have to cut our rates by 50, 60 percent, I'm sure we'll find takers. But, you know, it's not a good long term strategy. Uh, that's that's not going to secure your revenues for the future. Yeah, but what are you penciling in for the future very quickly over the next three years? Um, so we, I, from uh, from the existing inventory, or, you, or you, do you mean like from our expansion perspective as well? Existing inventory plus if expansion it comes through, given the rentals you're taking, the kind of occupancy of penciling yeah. in, what kind of revenue growth are you looking at? Oh, say three yeah. to five years. So I think over three to five years, we'd like to see twenty-five to thirty percent of growth easily, um, and I think that depends also on our expansion strategy, our current. Uh, centers themselves, uh, we'd like to see a healthy rate of revenue growth, keeping occupancy at 90%, 95%. We were exactly, we were at 95% before COVID hit. Uh, there's no reason why we, we won't hit that. We had reached 95% in about a year and three months of being operational in BKC. And I'm very optimistic that we're going to see those same growth numbers with um, our current center. And um, and I'm pretty optimistic that if that third lockdown doesn't happen, we'll probably reach there by December or Jan at the latest. And that will enable us to really ex expedite uh, what we're looking to do going forward. Are you looking at raising any funding? Uh, we're looking at options on on uh, from different perspectives because funding um, in real estate can be mixed. If you work with partners who are looking at uh, perhaps putting in the capital expenditure, um, then the revenue share model works great. And as a result, you don't have to look at um, high numbers of uh, funding. But if you're looking at internal, if you're looking at the capital expenditure yourself, then the equation changes. So it really depends on the partners uh, that we work with going forward. Um, and I think that's what's going to decide uh, how we grow. All right, uh, Robin, thank you so much for joining us and talking to us about Dextrous, the co-working space uh, with two centers in Mumbai. Here's wishing you all the very best uh, for the years ahead. So let's hope we see many more Dextrous centers all over the country. Thank you, Anisha. Happy to be here. Really nice. Thank you. 
that wraps up another episode of green shoots uh, we'll be back with another chat with another founder join us again till then bye bye